He's co-founder and CEO of a startup called Thuz. So without further ado, let's welcome Warren to Stanford. <laughs> It's great to be here, and it's, um, it's actually fascinating to be here. I almost went over to Terman Auditorium to give this lecture, and uh, it's a big hole in the ground. Uh, obviously, you guys know that. Uh, things have changed a lot, and in fact, uh, when I first got here on campus, I got here in 1985, I, uh, I was driven around by uh, some folks who actually had a car, and we went around Campus Drive, which, by the way, was slightly different, or at least the, the, the roads were uh, configured differently back then. And we were looking around at all the construction, and we were like, wow, there's so much construction around here. This construction's going to end like in a couple of years, and then Stanford will be done. And uh, I'm glad to see that I was right uh, about that. It's, it's, it's incredible, all this. Um, as, as Tom so nicely mentioned, uh, I'm the founder of a company called Thuz, which is in the sports space, and I'll try very hard not to be shamelessly promotive about that, but it will, I'll, I'll definitely touch upon it a number of times throughout this talk. Um, but I have to start off with a, with a sports question, of course. So, number one, who watched the Super Bowl? All right, excellent. Number two, who enjoyed watching the Super Bowl? Pretty good, pretty good game as it was. Um, so let's, let's get to more broader picture. Who watches SportsCenter here? All right, a few less... People. Who enjoys watching Sports Center? All right. So you get your fix of sports. So one, one more final question. When you watch sports and Sports Center, do you ever go, wow, I wish I'd watched that game? Or at least the ending of that game. Like the last five minutes of that game or the last 10 minutes of the, that game or the incredible comeback or whatever. Do you ever have that feeling? Well, that's what Thuz is all about. We're actually taking a whole bunch of information that's out there and we're compiling in real time the excitement level of every professional and college sporting event that's out there. And we actually do the same thing for prof the individual athletes who are competing in these games as well. So if you're busy, you're doing your problem sets, you're in your study groups, you're eating whatever, you'll get a notification and say, hey, great game. Watch this one. It's, again, 15 minutes left to go in X or two innings left to go in Y. You'll be able to tune in, take a study break, gather your friends around, see an amazing conclusion to a game, and you won't have to take the risk, so to speak, of tuning into a game for three and a half hours or letting it distract you, because, of course, you guys are focused on those problem sets and group projects and things like that. But that's what we're all about. We're taking a whole bunch of interesting information, turning it into real-time data so that you guys can have fun watching sports and, is, in fact, exploring sports that you might not have otherwise watched. And more of this will come out about Thuz. But underpinning everything that we're doing is statistics because we're taking objective data about these games and we're manipulating it and turning it into a single value about excitement, T turning it into a subjective sentiment or measuring a subjective sentiment. So this gets me to the next set of questions here because I just mentioned statistics. Who here has taken statistics? All right, quite a few folks. Who here has taken calculus? Quite a few more. Show of hands, who likes calculus better? Who likes statistics better? Who doesn't like either? <laughs> okay, uh, I'll just make a, a determination that you guys said that calculus is much more interesting than statistics. And uh, that's typically the reaction, although I didn't count all the hands, I'll, I'll just assume that was the case. But our business is all founded upon statistics. And the point that I won't, well, that I will make without making, having any defense behind it is that life is statistics. Life is not calculus. Calculus is all about perfection. Assume a frictionless surface, assume this, assume this, assume this, then you can integrate or do whatever you want and you'll get the right answer. But it never plays out like that in reality because reality is statistics. Reality is probabilistic. It's non-deterministic. And so in our business, we're all about exploiting non-determinism. You don't know the outcome of the game. You don't know if the game's going to be exciting. But yet, you still want to know. You still want to know if it's worth your time to tune in. Are you going to admit, why should I watch the highlight when I can watch the real game? But I don't want to tune into the real game because it might not be interesting. So there's a lot of things in life that are uncertain. 
we're exploiting that. But all of you who are clearly on an entrepreneurial path are also exploiting uncertainty. Because what I will posit here and the, the whole premise of my talk is that determinism has very little role in entrepreneurship. It has a lot of a role or a big role in engineering. And many of you, most of you are engineering majors. But when it comes to entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs seek out uncertainty. They exploit uncertainty. And, it, and uncertainty is your life. And so what I want to do, actually speaking of life, is I'm going to go through a little bit of a chronology of my background and how I got to where I am today. And in so doing, I'm going to explore a bunch of, of uncertainties, a bunch of trade-offs. And hopefully, there will be some gems and pearls of wisdom. Some of these things are going to be very obvious to you, and I'll hopefully point those out. Other things are going to be not so obvious. And the bottom line, of course, is there are no right answers because everything is uncertain. But as an entrepreneur, you're going to be faced right, right in front of you, right in front of your team, right in front of whatever task you have at hand with uncertainty. And so as much as you want to go out there and say, I'm building X or designing Y or whatever, and it's going to be the best thing, inside you're going to be saying to yourself, I'm not really sure. And I guess maybe one of the key takeaways of this talk is it's okay to be uncertain because you should be uncertain. But me talking today in front of you, I'm actually uncertain what I'm going to say right now. I've got, this is my talk right here, but it'll come out some way. A lot of uncertainty. And I'm going to tell you about my time in the venture capital business. Lots of uncertainty. And I'm going to tell you a lot about Thu's and tell you how it's going to be the greatest thing. I'm uncertain. So let's start. We'll kick this off. Uh, I don't have any props. I don't have a presentation. So hopefully this, uh, these things will be easy to keep in your mind. But um, I started out, as I already mentioned, at Stanford uh, in 1985, an undergraduate. And this is actually a good place to start our story because this was my first time west of the Mississippi River. I come from Illinois originally. And when I came to Stanford, obviously, you, you meet a diversity of people. And it's absolutely fascinating. New environment, everything's new, everybody's uncertain, obviously. Um, but one of the things that I didn't realize at the time is that when I stepped foot on Stanford campus, I'd be sowing the seeds for the founding team of Thuz. And it's actually, it's a wonderful story in that when I first thought of this idea as I was sitting back watching a football game a couple years ago, my first thought wasn't to you know, talk to some entrepreneurs that I'd backed at DFJ. I'd been in the venture business for 13 years. And my next thought wasn't to think about the business school and think about all my colleagues that I met there. And they're fantastic colleagues there, fantastic folks I've worked with at DFJ. My first thought was right back to my undergraduate experience in Stanford. I pulled in my freshman RA to be my VP of engineering. I pulled in a buddy of mine who married a classmate, actually Dean Julie's husband, <laughs> for those who know Dean Julie, and for those who know her husband. Uh, as my other co-founder, the three of us started this company. The fourth guy to join us as a co-founder was my class at Stanford. And so this core group of founding individuals all came from my undergraduate days at Stanford. These were folks that I had stayed in touch with. We had, maybe we had worked together, maybe we hadn't, but whatever. We had stayed in touch together, and we just, it was a great network. And it brings up this first kind of conflict or balance or tension, if you will. And this is an easy one. This is a layup. The tension is between what is more important when starting a venture. Is it the team or is it the idea? And along with the idea, you can say, is it the market? Is it the opportunity? Is it the business? Is it the technology? But team and everything else. And in all my experience at DFJ for 13 years, team, team, team. And my experience with Thu's right now, having now run this business for, it depends on how you count. It's all uncertain. But a year plus, it's all about team. And no matter where we go with this business or how successful or unsuccessful we are with this business, this journey is going to be fantastically rewarding because of the people that um, I'm surrounded by and the people who have joined this venture. And like I said, this is the layup because I, I think a lot of you have had this ingrained in you. As time goes on, 
the venture does become more about the market, more about the product, more about the defensibility, and all those things that come to bear and you have to really focus on. And you're going to hire more and more people, and you'll lose touch with, you know, employee number 81. I can't remember who that is. But right now, it's all about team, and it really makes this experience fantastic. But there is, there's always some tension between what should lead the charge. And I would say if you're thinking about starting a company, think about your team. Think about your team first, especially if you don't have that opportunity in front of you. Or if you have that opportunity in front of you, think about who would be the best folks to join you in that venture. So that's my Stanford undergrad. It can be encapsulated in meeting great people and then roping them into my startup company many, many years later. Um, while I was an undergraduate at Stanford, I spent the summer at Hughes Aircraft Company. Uh, actually, two summers at Hughes Aircraft Company. It's probably called Raytheon now or something. It's uh, down in Southern California. And uh, while I was there, one of the projects that I worked on was called the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program basically a big weather satellite for the military and also for uh, consumer use. Um, I worked there uh, with a guy named Lou Gomberg, who was a aged veteran of the satellite business and uh, had a great experience for the summer doing all sorts of things, which I can't exactly recall now. But what I do recall is at the very end of the summer, he put his arm around me and said, Warren, gosh, you did a really good job. Thanks, Lou. You know, you could be the program manager of this when it launches in 2013. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Lou. That's, that's great. And, um, and Lou, of course, thinking about this, uh, and by the way, I haven't changed the names to protect the innocent, so thanks, Lou. Um, I was thinking to myself, you know, in a way, that was the absolute worst thing he could ever say to me after a summer of work at, at, at Hughes. I mean, I can't come back to this. <laughs> But the other thing, it was the absolute best thing that happened to me because it immediately informed me that I can't come back to this. It wasn't for me. And it, it, it brings up tension number two, if you will. And tension number two is perfection versus imperfection. And the fact that in the satellite business, you don't have many shots. You don't want your satellite blowing up in space or not working or functioning once it's in space. It's got to work. And so the things that we were designing into that satellite in 1987 were things that had been tried, true, and tested for the past 10 years. So if, if, we, if you do the math here, or just think about times, in 1987, we were designing a satellite for 2013 that was designed with equipment built and tested in 1977. And... It was all because it had to be perfect. And of course, it was going to be changed over time. But we were still designing the satellite. And I'm, I'm, I don't even know if the satellite's going to be launched next year. It's actually coming up. I should celebrate it or go to the launch. Or maybe it's, the program's been canceled. But there are some businesses that require perfection. And there's other businesses that require imperfection. And of course, if you're in the medical device world, you've got to get closer to the perfection side of things. And of course, that's why medical device Companies and pharmaceutical companies are very different beasts altogether. But if you're designing an app or a web experience or whatever, obviously imperfection is a great tool to have. It's kind of like, I, I don't know if you guys call it this anymore, but the god of partial credit. You're doing a problem set. You get 75% correct. At least you got 75%. You didn't get 100% of the answer wrong, even though the answer was wrong. God of partial credit works for you in spades as an entrepreneur. And you have to use that as a tool to uh, get out, get your product launched, get customer feedback, learn from your mistakes, pivot, and do it again, and iterate and pivot and iterate and pivot. And it's all about embracing imperfection. And again, I don't think this is anything new, but you're going to have some experiences where you're going to have to be perfect. And identifying those scenarios and differentiating that from other scenarios is extremely helpful. So, and it also has to do with risk-taking and risk-avoiding. Again, entrepreneurs are taking huge risk. And at DFJ, we were trying to take huge risk. And we did a really good job, I believe, of doing that. But at the same time, we had a portfolio of companies that we were backing. And by having a portfolio of companies, we were clearly in the risk-avoiding uh, position. You know, we, didn't, we knew that of a portfolio, let's say, of 20 companies, only a couple of these companies were actually really going to take off and be hugely successful. So we knew that 
out of 20, 18 we're not going to do, well, they'd, be, they'd do fine, let's say. But two, two we're going to make the whole fund. So that's the balance between risk seeking and risk avoiding. You have a portfolio of companies. You have a, a portfolio of risk seeking companies. Now, as the CEO of a startup company, we're taking a heck of a lot of risk. But at the same time, we're also taking in other people's money. And the moment you take in other people's money, you have to realize that you have to start avoiding risk to a certain degree. And we'll get back to this later because I really do want to make money for my investors. And as a consequence, the more I really want to make money for my investors, the more I don't want to lose money, the more I don't want to go out of business. And that's not a healthy thing for an entrepreneur. A entrepreneur should want, you know, be going for it and just, you know, I bet the company every week or I bet the company every month. But you still have to balance these things out. And so when somebody, say, you know, somebody gives you money and says, hey, you know, take that risk, that's, that's great. That's nice, but there's a lot of stakeholders. Oh, yeah, there's employees. Not just investors, employees. Our fifth, the fifth person we brought on, we brought this individual on as a founder, he came to me one day, said, Warren, I'm selling my house. I'm like, great, that's cool. Why are you selling your house? He goes, I want to have enough money to last this startup phase. I'm like, that's really scary. <laughs> You're selling your house. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, and, and this was at a time when we were all part-time. Because, again, risk-seeking, risk-avoiding. We didn't actually jump into this venture full time from day one. We were going to test the waters. We were going to figure it out. And here's this guy coming to me. He's like, I'm selling my house. And I'm like, don't sell your house until we're all committed. And in fact, this turned out to be the forcing function for getting our company full time, full speed ahead. He, you know, in fact, I don't think he ended up selling his house. God. Dang. Anyway, but he forced us in the right direction. We, we have no regrets whatsoever. Um, so anyway, somehow I got to that out of Hughes Aircraft Company. So um, after, um, after Hughes Aircraft Company, well, that was one of my summers. After my undergraduate days, I got a, I went co-term here. I got a master's. And uh, I did the smart product design ME218 program here. Anybody in that program here? Yeah, all right. You're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> Actually, all these programs are great um, and punishing. Um, so... One of the things about uh, was 218, and actually really specifically about my research that I did while I was here as a master's student. So I did uh, work in the robotics lab of Professor Mark Kakowski. And um, one, I learned a really big lesson there because going into uh, the research, you're, you're suddenly becoming a specialist. Up to this time, I was mechanical engineering. You know, what, what is mechanical engineering? Um, it's lots of things. And in fact, I loved mechanical engineering because it was lots of things. But then suddenly you're doing research, and we weren't just doing robotics research. We were doing grasping and manipulation of robotic hands. Oh, and even more so, we were doing slip sensing of robotic fingers. And it, you, know, you could keep going down and down into, into the minutia, not to be pejorative at all, but it gets very specific. And it really started opening my eyes to the fact that at some point in my life, I'm actually going to have to decide what I do. And I need to figure out, am I a specialist or am I a generalist? Or maybe I don't really have to figure it out, but I've given this a lot of thought. Um, and this brings up another story, because uh, in, very soon I'll talk to you about, or tell you about my time at Baxter Healthcare Corporation, which was my first job out of college. And while I was at Baxter, I had the pleasure of working uh, with an amazing engineer named Dean Kamen. And you might know Dean because he's done all sorts of fascinating things like the Segway scooter, and he's the guy who started U.S. First the robotics competition, uh, done a number of different things. But he's an amazing engineer. And so I was working with him. He was designing the next generation kidney dialysis machine, and I was designing the next, next generation kidney dialysis machine. And I realized that he was good. Like, you know, as, as much as I was like, oh, I'm doing this cool WYSIWYG technology kind of stuff. Actually, WYSIWYG's totally the wrong word. Uh, cool technology. Um, he, he would always know more than me in, in terms of what I was doing. Like, he could come over and look over my shoulder. In fact, Mark Kukowski did the same thing. It was eerie. I'd be, like, in a lab for 56 hours straight, and he'd come in the next day, kind of look over my shoulder and go, you forgot that. I was like, how the heck do you know that? Um, and Dean would do the same thing. He'd look over my shoulder, and he's, you know, you're, you're doing something wrong or whatever. 
But it was then that I really grokked the whole notion that he was a specialist. Like, if you ask him about, you know, hey, uh, he, he lives in uh, New Hampshire. You know, how are those New England Patriots today? He'd look at me and go, basketball? And if you said, hey, did you see that cool movie? You know, Terminator, you know, and he'd go, movie? And it, it occurred to me that he had invested his life into being, and he's not monodimensional, so I'm exaggerating, but, you know, into doing all these things over here and not doing these things over here. He had decided that he was going to be darn good at this stuff, and he could care less about this stuff, or maybe whatever. But I couldn't do that. I wanted to watch the Patriots. Well, I wanted to watch the 49ers. OK, really, I wanted to watch the Bears, because I'm from Chicago. But that's besides the point. Um, and I wanted to go to movies. And I wanted to you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I couldn't get it out of my head that I was a generalist. And as much as I wanted to be, you know, like at every point in my life, I want to be this person, I want to be this person, or this person, or this, I, couldn't, I couldn't be those people. I had to be me. And me was a generalist. And so this was a very interesting tension, because I wasn't necessarily comfortable with the outcome of this. But I had to be, because I just couldn't be something I wasn't. And it was just an interest, again, uncertainty. You suddenly you realize that there's these things out there that you can make decisions. But there may be something inside you that's preventing you from doing something. I couldn't stop watching sports. I couldn't stop watching movies, collecting records. Oh, that's old school, right? Um, in any event, uh, and it was, this was a, a realization I first got when getting into the master's program, because there you're focused. And it's interesting, I had an interesting choice a, a couple years into my master's. Um, well, I guess I did actually get the master's. I had a choice whether to go on for a PhD or not. And in fact, it was kind of like, sure, I'll go on and get a PhD, and I'll, I'll teach. And, and that was kind of like what I saw in front of me. But my girlfriend at the time said, hey, I'm going to med, sc med school in Illinois. I said, cool. <laughs> and she said, want to come? And suddenly I had to make a decision. And again, it gets back to uncertainty, right? I mean, like, should I follow my girlfriend to Illinois, back to Illinois. Just serendipitously, she happened to be going to Stanford and from Illinois. Um, and what would I do? In fact, this was 1991. In 1991, the economy was really bad. And so there were very few jobs here in Silicon Valley. There were probably even fewer jobs in, um, in Illinois. But as I already mentioned, I already gave the punchline. I ended up working for Baxter Healthcare Corporation, getting completely lucky that I landed a job that was really, really interesting. And like, I faint at the sight of blood, and I was in the renal division doing dialysis machines, which is absolutely the worst possible thing. But I got over it. <laughs> My first interview at, at Baxter, they flew me out there. I walk into a lab, and there's literally a jug of bovine blood there. And I walk out of the room immediately. I kind of collect myself. And I hear the guy who was taking me around introducing me. You know, this is Warren Packer from Stanford. Uh, Warren. But I didn't keel over. I just went in the hallway and collected. And then I walked right in, and it was, it was OK. Um, but it, um, uncertainty. So uh, the question that, that popped up, or the tension that popped up, is this whole tension between chance and planning, or luck and planning, or whatever it might be. I did not plan you know, when I started my Stanford career to go to Illinois six years later with my girlfriend. I did not plan to get into the medical device design business. I did not plan. There's a lot of things I didn't plan. But this was a huge decision point in my life. And yet, I was leaving it all up to chance. And I'm assuming, well, OK, I'm just truth, candor. I'm anally retentive. I like planning. I like organizing. You know, like when I got my you know, freshman book, whatever they call it at Stanford, I was planning out my major. I did, you know, even though I didn't really know what I wanted. And then every year, you know, what courses do I have? How do I get my GREs? How do I do this? Whatever. I was planning. And then suddenly, I'm uprooted, thrust into Illinois. Or back to Illinois. I guess that was some, somewhat comfortable. But again, it's all about luck versus, or chance versus planning. And again, there's nothing that says one's right or one's wrong. But this whole notion that you can take a very organized and 
planned life and suddenly uproot it and hope that something's going to come out of it that's actually valuable is a very interesting one. So I ended up not getting a PhD. I ended up working in the industry. And in working in industry, I learned a lot about business as much as they let me out of the lab. But from there, um, I applied to business school. And because I knew somewhere in the back of my head, I actually had to have some notion of business. and It would be a good thing. So I applied to the GSB. And I was fortunate enough to get in here. And one of my first classes in the GSB was organizational behavior. And here I am, an engineering student taking organizational behavior. We're learning about people. You know, what's with this? I, I mean, you know, gosh, there's, you know, accounting and there's uh, cash flow analysis, analysis and there's, there's entrepreneurship. There's lots of things that we could be doing that's more important than organizational behavior. And uh, I, I guess this might be one of the things that's been pounded down. But, of course, people is the foundation of the business. And I already talked about that as tension number one between team and market or whatever. That team is so important. But the culture of your company is absolutely pivotal. And here I was the first quarter, or was it a semester, whatever, of business school, and learning about organizational behavior and really not having an appropriate context for it. But it was a very interesting uh, experience to get the most important class right up front. And um, the story, I guess, that I'll tell around that is one going back to, or going forward, fast forward into Thu's. Because right now, as we think about culture, we are struggling with how do you put a culture into a company? What should that culture be? And how does it differ from other uh, cultures that are out there and what we want to actually end up doing? And one of the interesting things about our company that differs from Facebook or other uh, companies that are started by younger individuals is we're, we're an old company. They've got guys like me that are there. So it was founded by you know, a few 40-year-olds there. And the question is, like, well, what happens when we start diversifying this population? Because A, diversi diversity is key for us not having groupthink and getting more ideas, and, ha and just all, all sorts of things, as you guys know. But how do we attract folks that are out of college that want to, I don't know, work from 11 in the morning to 1 in the morning? And how do they put up with the fact that we have kids, and we actually work you know, from this time to this time, and we want to go home and have dinner with them, and then we want to work on our P you know, PC at home? It's something, actually, this is a real uncertainty. It's a real tension. But... It's not something we could plan out. Again, chance would have it that we started a company when we were not 20 years old. And then the other question that occurred to us is like, are we going to be advantaged because we've got all this experience? Or are we going to be disadvantaged because we actually already know some things we shouldn't do? And it's actually that childlike curiosity, and I don't mean that pejoratively, <laughs> that allows you to do things that others simply won't do. Are we going to be just too planned and perfect Again, not, not to take that to an extent, but planned and perfect. And we're going to miss the cool opportunities, whereas those who are more youthful will just say, yeah, I'm going to do that. You know, if I think about Napster, I mean, Napster got in a, a ton of trouble for what it did, but it was the start of a revolution in the whole music business. Pretty amazing what they did. And a lot of the things they did because they didn't know better. They didn't know otherwise. So there's a tension there. Again, there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. But we're, you know, we're, we're getting more and more younger individuals into the company, and it's absolutely fantastic because that is a skill set that we need. Uh, but we have to think about culture. How do you bridge a culture when, again, there's different work habits and different work styles? Again, no answer. I'm not coming with that. But um, obviously, I guess underpinning all of this is there's absolutely no doubt that having this diversity within the company is going to make us absolutely a uh, much stronger, stronger organization. But anyway, th so that came from the GSB um, in terms of organizational behavior being right in front of us. Another class that we took there, how many have heard of uh, touchy-feely uh, at the GSB? This is a very fuzzy class. Um, do you guys still use the term fuzzy? Yeah, good. I'm not totally out of it. Um, and you know what, what, what touchy-feely really taught us is that there's a lot of intuition that comes into what we do. And again, as an entrepreneur, intuition is absolutely paramount. 
Um, in your engineering classes, you're dealing with a lot of fact. Uh, the intuitive part is absolutely cr critical for an entrepreneur. And again, that's not going to be any surprise to you, but we value intuition as in a venture capital firm. We value intuition at a startup company. There's very little facts to go on, but that's just that underpins what's going on there. Um, while I was in the GSB, I started a company, and the company was called Ingara uh, Database Systems. A buddy of mine was still getting his PhD, even after I had gone to Illinois, come back, gone to business school, and he had this technology. And this actually just presents the age-old tension of, is it the product that matters, or is it the, the problem uh, that matters? And this was a classic case of a uh, solution looking for a problem uh, to solve. And... Um, Again, luck played a huge role in this because we started this business in 1996. And you might recall, 1996 was just about this time that the internet was taken off. And uh, Netscape had gone public in 95, and people were just trying to figure out what this Yahoo and InfoSeq and Excite <laughs> stuff were. But um, we started a database company, which had nothing to do with the internet. Uh, but I, again, in terms of uncertainty, we had no idea what problem we were going to solve. All we knew is that this guy did his PhD dissertation on this particular type of database and that perhaps we could help out uh, somebody else in the, in the enterprise space. Um, ultimately, the company pivoted and went forward as a marketing information system for Internet companies, basically doing real-time marketing. So again, keeping your eyes open to those problems that are good for your solution makes a lot of sense. Um, but... I would, I would say that starting with a problem is usually a much more helpful thing to do. But again, you're surrounded by great solutions here. And so being able to exploit a solution is obviously, uh, that perhaps is, has the least friction in terms of taking you to the next level. With Thu's, it was all about identifying the problem. And my problem was very personal. I just didn't want, have the time anymore to spend three hours sitting in front of a game that wasn't very interesting. Because I had turned on the Bears against the 49ers, my two favorite teams, and an hour in, I was like, wow, this should be a great game, but it wasn't. And then my mind wandered, and I was like, okay, how could somebody have told me this was a great game without blowing the ending? And then I started thinking, oh, I can you know, look at these statistics and this and this and this, and you know, next thing you know, we, we started a company. So that was a problem looking for a solution. Uh, with Engara, it was the opposite way around. Um, but again, luck uh, caught up with us, and we got to pivot right into the Internet space, which was a great place to go. Um, so I'll, I'll fast forward to DFJ. Um, DFJ was a, a phenomenal experience. I, uh, I joined the firm in 97, and of course, again, the internet was just taking off. So we had all this, you know, the wind behind our sails. We were focused on the internet, back to a whole bunch of very interesting companies uh, while we were there. Um, and one of the things, the tenets that we've uh, told our entrepreneurs that is that you have to be focused. You've got to be focused because there's too much to do. You don't have enough resources. You've got to get things done. You've got to be focused. But in the same breath, DFJ's mantra is you've got to change the world. And it's a, again, it's a very interesting tension because between changing the world and focus is a lot of room. And if you're going to change the world, how can you be focused? Because you can be so focused you become irrelevant. On the other hand, if, you know, if, well, vice versa. Um, and so it's a very interesting tension. If you ask DFJ folks, they'll lead with change the world because you know, venture capitalists want that you know, incredible home run hit. They want the Baidus of the world and the Skypes of the world and the Hotmails of the world to be in their portfolio. And that's, those are change the world opportunities. But as an entrepreneur, you need to focus. And there's tension there because you've got, on the one hand, somebody saying change the world. And on the other hand, a lot of People are saying, hey, if you don't focus, you're not getting anywhere. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to get a beachhead. You've got to expand from your beachhead. So you'll get advice on both sides of the table there. And again, it's uncertain. There's no firm answer in terms of how you're supposed to approach this. In a way, what you're supposed to do is juggle both, which makes life as an entrepreneur very difficult, but we never told you it was going to be easy. At Thu's, we're actually doing a two-pronged strategy. We have our own consumer apps that you can get on uh, in the App Store and the Marketplace. Um, so go ahead and do that after my talk. Uh, but we also have um, partnerships that we're building with the industry incumbents. We're actually working with folks like 
ESPN and CBS and Comcast and Dish and T-Mobile and Sprint and these big behemoths. And they, you know, are, you know, through their channels, we can create a very uh, large company that has impact for their customer base. But also, at the same time, we need to learn about our customers and do some things that we have control over. And that leads us to developing our own applications and building up our own customer base. Not in competition with each other, but just because there's this tension between focus and doing something that's huge and really big. And you need both. And this is very, I mean, we're stretched. There's no doubt we're making trade-offs here that others might not make. And again, there's no right decision. And people will give you advice on one side or other side, but you just have to realize you're going to be faced with this uncertainty. The other um, element where there's no right answer is speed versus patience. Uh, when I, in, while I was at DFJ, I backed a company called Xfire, which is a social network for gamers. And this was, a company was founded by and run by a, a, a guy who's a phenomenal entrepreneur named Mike Cassidy. And Mike gives a great talk, and you might have seen it, about speed. Speed is everything. And when Mike talks, you listen. I mean, he, he's done it before. Um, he's had four successful companies. Uh, so you might as well listen to him. <laughs> I listen to him. And, and speed is absolutely paramount in what we do. And everybody, there's many reasons for speed. But all the same, there's an element of patience that is required in entrepreneurship that is really, really important. Because if we were just in control of our own destiny, we could do speed up the hilt. If it was just our mobile apps, if it was just our connected TV app, if it was just us, we can go really fast. But when it comes down to it, if you're going to work with partners and your partners are going to help propel you into something bigger, you need to have um, patience because these guys are not going to be moving very fast. And so, again, between what is obviously great advice, which is speed, there's this counterpoint of patience which you need to keep in the back of your head, and it's going to be... That, this is a tension that kills us because when you're talking to these partners, they, they do the darndest things. They make decisions that you just can't believe that they're making. And, you know, they switch up staff left and right. You're, you know, talking to one person one day and the next person the next day and there's a, a rift the next day and a reorg the next day. That's okay. It just happens. You have to understand there's a lot of patience that goes into what you're doing. Things just don't happen as fast as um, you always think. Um, another great tension that we learned from investing internationally at DFJ is global versus local. And this comes up a lot here. And I think this is actually captured in that saying that you need to think globally and act locally. I've got to be careful if I say that the wrong way. Um, we, uh, it, it's a global economy. There is no doubt that you know, whether, you know, what's going to happen with the US economy or the European economy or whatever, it's going to happen. It's going to happen beyond your control. But in the final analysis, it's all about the global economy, which is critical. What's happening in Asia? What's happening in Africa? What's happening in Europe and, and the U.S.? You have to be prepared for what's going on. But at the same time, getting back to the focus, you need to realize that you've got to think locally. Because if you're going to expand your business into some of these regions, you have to know what's going on in those regions. In fact, just the other night, we had a call with the Royal Challengers of Bangalore in the uh, IPL. Indian Premier League, cricket. And, um, you know, cricket is one of the sports that we cover. It's a great sport. I, it's not one that I know very well, but, it, you know, huge following. And IPL has got a great following, and I guess the Royal Challengers have a great following as well. Um, and we're talking to them about how we integrate our service with theirs. And one guy very astutely on the call says, well, I looked at your app, and it's all, you know, it's kind of focused on U.S. sports, and you have U.S. service providers and all this stuff. And we're like, yep, yep, we admit it. We're guilty. Uh, but the focus part of our business is we don't even know where to begin when it comes to India. But the global, thinking globally and thinking big part says we need to be involved with cricket. We need to be involved with um, rugby. And we need to be involved with international football, the real football. Um, and if we're going to get into India, if we're going to get into China, into Japan, Korea, Germany, whatever... We need to have partners there who help us out because it's a very complex landscape. Um, but we have to be thinking about heading into that direction because that's an important part of our future. And so we're laying the seeds now for our ability to execute on the international landscape. And hopefully the Royal Challengers will take us up on their offer and help us into India. 
And hopefully we'll get a call from Bayern Munich to get ourselves into, Ju uh, into Germany and from an EPL team to get us into Britain. We'll see how these things play out, but we have to have, have some patience. So finally, I'm at Thuz. Um, as I mentioned, we, uh, the idea came a couple of years ago. Um, we really started full time, you know, put el everything else aside a year ago. And there are some tensions, as I've already mentioned, that we're addressing. And I'll just, um, I'll give you a few extra ones that, uh, as, as kind of a bonus, and then wrap up and, and go to Q&A. Um, one of the first things we had to do was compensate people for the work, even when we were working part time. And that brought up cash versus equity. And all of us at first were on equity. But what we did was something that I'll throw out to you as a proposal, because I'm not sure how often this has been done, but we created an economy in our company where cash and equity were fungible. And basically, when we raise seed money for our company, we priced the round. And we basically said, you know, it's whatever, 10 cents per share uh, for this. And when individuals invested in our company, they invested at 10 cents per share. And when somebody did work for us, we simply could convert that e either a dollar amount or a share amount. And it just didn't matter to us. Because some of the folks that were working part-time for our company needed cash, and some of the folks that were working for our company wanted equity. And we wanted to accommodate both without, without creating attention. So we created this economy within the company. It forced us to price our seed round. And there's, it's very popular these days to do a convertible, and I won't get into all the details, but uh, to basically bring money in that would convert into a round that would be priced later. And we decided not to do that so we could create this economy. And I'll just throw out that this experiment, I believe, worked very well. Because those of us who wanted equity, we were, we were all in for equity, and those who wanted cash, no problem. And you could take out cash and get equity. You could put in cash. Wait, you could take out cash? Well, you know what I mean. Anyway, you could go back and forth. Um, but this was a very interesting decision that we made for fundraising. Number two um, in ter from Thu's. Valuation. How do you set a valuation for your company when there's not much there? And of course, that's an art rather than a science. But the point that I'm going to just push out here in the next minute is it's, it's very attractive to have a high valuation and value your company at something that you can go and boast about or at least internally feel like, hey, we got this high valuation. Um, we actually set out to get the lowest valuation we could. And that's not exactly correct because we didn't want to just give away the company. But we, and this is going to really sound weird perhaps, we really want to make our investors money. And as a consequence, we don't want to raise money at a super high valuation. We want to make sure that the valuation that we set on our company is low enough so that we give our investors the maximum chance of making money in the venture. Which, of course, we want to give ourselves the maximum chance of making money in the venture. And if you want to raise a subsequent round of financing and your prior round is priced too high, it becomes more difficult. So we strove to raise as little money as we could at as low a valuation as, uh, as we could. And we're now just, just now going out for our first institutional round of financing, and it seems to be playing out well because we're not getting pushback in terms of where our prior round uh, valuation was. So something to think about. You can brag a lot about high valuations, but they, you want the right valuation. You've got to balance dilution. You've got to balance um, getting your next round. Um, and finally, well, I guess the final point I've already brought up is, do you care or not care about your investors? Do you care or not care about your venture capitalists? And this is, I guess it's an obvious one coming from somebody who was formerly a venture capitalist. But I have seen on many occasions an entrepreneur very, very thankful for the money that comes in uh, from their venture capital backers, but then forgetting the fact that the venture capitalist has their own goals and desires in terms of making money and making money fast. And it's something to think about. They're a stakeholder. Your employees are stakeholders. Your customers, your partners, they're all stakeholders. You've got to balance all these things in incredible uncertainty. And it's very difficult to do. But it's, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll implore you that as you build your business forward, don't lose sight of any of these stakeholders. And take on the challenge of balancing all these different uncertainties. There are no answers, but ultimately you'll make really good decisions because you'll be able to justify them based on how they, your decisions impact all the different stakeholders. Uh, not easy, but I think a lot of you are going into entrepreneurship, and you'll realize that in the final analysis, you are living in uncertainty, 
and um, you're just going to have to deal with it. So that's, um, that's the, the story as I run it down, and I'd be very happy to take questions on any element of the stock. Okay. Of your company, Thuz, is an amazing sound. Is it the initial of your founder, or what? What is it? Oh, uh, so Thuz, which is spelled T H. Oh, with question. What, where does where does uh, Thuz come from, and what what is the name uh, derived from? So Thuz, which is spelled T H U U Z, uh, and I'll have to explain that. And it's, actually, that's really easy to explain. The URL was available, believe it or not. <laughs> Five letters long, and you can kind of look at it phonetically, kind of. Um, but it, it basically is short for enthusiasm or enthusiast. Uh, in fact, when we were thinking about the company, we were saying to ourselves, there are sports fanatics out there, and the sports fanatics are already watching. You know, if they're a 49ers fanatic, you're going to be watching the 49ers. We're not going to tell you anything new. But it's the enthusiast. It's the person that loves a great game but isn't necessarily always tuned in. That's the person we're appealing to. It's kind of like the 95% uh, that we're appealing to. So it's all about enthusiasm. So you dabbled in entrepreneurship, and then you went off and you were a VC for more than a decade, where you dealt with a lot of entrepreneurs. And now you've done an unusual thing, which is going back and being an entrepreneur. And I won't even say back, because this is really your first big venture as an entrepreneur. Have there been any really big surprises to you after, you know, after being around entrepreneurs for so long? Have there been some big surprises now that you're actually in the driver's seat? Yes. <laughs> so the question was, are there big surprises now that I'm an entrepreneur rather than a venture capitalist? And I guess in a way I was prepared for surprise because, again, uncertainty, surprise, et cetera. Uh, and in fact, I, I guess I'll make a couple points here. There are a couple of absolute, and then I'll answer your question, <laughs> hopefully. Um, there are a couple of absolute notions. Like I, so I just talked a lot about uncertainty, but I think there are some absolutes here and things I wasn't surprised about. The number one thing is it's really hard work. And there's no letting up. There's nothing, you know, as, as a venture capitalist, there are so many things to do and there's so many ways you can add value to a company. You can't possibly do it all. So therefore, you just pick and choose. And, you know, it's, it's actually comforting to know that you can't do everything and your companies are still managed and they'll go forward whether, you know, you help or not. And you, you help, but you help as much as you can. As an entrepreneur, your company is moving forward only insofar as you're doing something. And it is really hard work. And so that's obviously, it's, that's, a, um, that's an absolute. Another absolute is prioritization. There's too little time. You've got to prioritize. You've got to be absolutely brutal in prioritizing. And another absolute is passion. And this is the thing that I think I'm most surprised about is how, much, how passionate I am about what I'm doing right now. And it's not that I wasn't passionate about the portfolio companies that I was backing. I love these companies. <laughs> But they weren't, it was all, they weren't my own. I mean, they were, you know, I had a part of them, and I, and I, I love them in their own way. <laughs> but what I'm doing now is just, it's, it's really, it's part of me. And I'm overjoyed. The, the, the folks that have come and joined our venture, I can't, I'm, I'm tickled that they've joined this venture because they've joined this passion. And it's really cool when they take it on, and I can let them fly, and, you know, I hear them talk about it. Um, it's really great. And so... There is not, you, the, the buzz that you get as an entrepreneur is phenomenal. And of course, the highs and the lows are, are, are huge, the swings. Um, and, you know, I have to be honest, when you're first starting out a company, even, you know, we've been at it again for a year or two, depending on how you count, um, there haven't been too many lows. Uh, we're, we'll brace for them. I mean, I'm sure something will happen. And I would say the, these, these early days are great because you're just clicking along, you know, it's, uh, you know, if you're growing from 1,000 users to 10,000 to 100,000, you know, you can do it. Um, you know, somewhere the tension comes into play where, you know, things go wrong. You lose a partner. Uh, something, your, your service goes down at the worst possible moment, whatever. And you'll hit those lows, and those lows will be super low. We don't have a portfolio as an entrepreneur. You don't have, you know, if, as, a, as a VC, if one of my companies was doing, was doing poorly, another company was doing great. That was always the case. And so you could balance that out. Um, the other thing that's interesting, again, I'm being very candid and open, the moment that we took in money and started this business full-time, I started dreaming. 
And I don't mean like I'm dreaming of how, you know, I mean like I started remembering my dreams. I go to sleep, I wake up in the morning, I said, I had a dream. I, I haven't remembered the first time I had a, you know, that I remember, I'm sorry, I don't even remember the last time I remembered a dream. And I was just thinking to myself, my brain's actually working differently now. My brain was working constantly. I guess I was able to kind of compartmentalize things or shut things down as a venture capitalist. But, or maybe there was too much to think about because there were 10 companies that I was thinking about. Here, there's one company. It's like, I, you know, again, this guy's going to sell his house and I've got this deliverable and I've got, you know, it's, it's more stressful. There's no doubt about that. But it's fun stressful. It's kind of X Games stressful. You know, we're, we're on the half pipe and it's cool. Uh, so there's a couple of nuances there. Yes? Um, you, you talk about being very passionate. And then I know you had a lot of different school experiences. Was there any course or major that, that really helped spark any of this passion that you have now? The, so the question is, are there any courses or other experiences that help to spark and promote this passion? That's a, that's a really interesting question. And it's, it's interesting because I'm so far removed, if you will, from my undergraduate years um, to think specifically about the impact. that I, You know, it's interesting. I guess in telling the story... Everything has had an impact on where I am today. And it's a bad answer, so I'll try to get a better answer in just a moment. Um, and there was so much luck and chance and uncertainty, again, that led, you know, I, I never planned on starting a company. It just kind of happened to me. Um, and in fact, as I mentioned, when we started the company, we were all part-time. And we, we didn't know, is this, is this company going to be real or is it not? How big could it be? Is it venture fundable or, or is it not? And... Um, you, we, you kind of, you almost have to be stoic and just go with it. <laughs> you know, it kind of carries you along. Um, but specific classes or courses or experience, you know, I think, I, I think one thing I look back on is um, my dad loves sports, and he would, you know, he'd force me to watch the Bears and the Bulls and the Blackhawks and University of Michigan, and his alma mater. And, um, you know, I guess, you know, that was important. <laughs> um, everything really is. I guess I'm not going to come up with a great answer uh, for you. I mean, really, I mean, there's, there's a lot of classes. Oh, here, one example. This is going to be really out of left field. Um, obviously, a lot of classes are terrific. One class that was so surprisingly interesting was my accounting class in business school. You go into accounting, you think, okay, you've got debits and credits, you've got a balance sheet, income statement, cash flow, whatever. It just is what it is. You plug it into Microsoft Excel. Well, the professor of this class took a completely different tack uh, um, on accounting. And it was all about the subjectivity of accounting, the way to look at numbers in different ways to inform or even mislead. And so we spent the entire quarter looking through balance sheets and income statements and annual reports of companies and determining who's hiding what and where were they hiding it. And then understanding at the end of the day that these things we thought are absolutes, like numbers and, you know, there's cash, and uh, are not absolute whatsoever. So I guess it's a good answer given that I just talked about uncertainty. But it just showed how, you know, intuitive <coughs> business is, how interpretive business is. And if Fortune 500 companies, if General Electric can be interpretive with its annual report, think of how interpretive you can be with a startup company. That was a very cool class. And again, not to discredit any other class. It's very interesting. One more question. Okay, one more question. Who gets to be the final question? Yes. Um, I, maybe they're related. I'm interested if you think that passion, like a, a real interest in the in the business that you want to start can make you myopic at all? And if, if you went back to your undergraduate cohort because they were all either somewhere between enthusiastic to passionate about sports, and do you seek to find people who really don't share an interest in sports so they right. can kind of ground you in some other... It's a, that's a great question. So the question was... Can your passion blind you to where you should go? Do you seek out others who are not as passionate, perhaps, to help round out the team? And, and this gets back to my point about diversity. I mean, there's so many different axes of diversity. And actually, one of them is the axes of dispassionate about sports. And I would say I, I would absolutely want the folks to be passionate uh, about foods. But 
the Dan, my third co-founder, is dispassionate about sports. He, um, he's the, yeah, he's the, he was at uh, Pandora for many years. He loves music. And he went from music to sports. He went from a passion of his to a whatever. And I, I thought kind of in my mind, this is really cool. Now, I also thought in my mind, ooh, is this going to work out? <laughs> but I really did think that this would be really cool because I wanted somebody who would look at our business and not get caught up in the hype and not get caught up in the emotion. And so it was great to have one of the three initial founders have this kind of dispassion. And he's our user experience guy. So he's always about, you know, how do we make this easy, intuitive, logical, beautiful, whatever. And he doesn't get caught up of in, you know, hey, the, you, know, you know, Stanford's got to be color cardinal and, uh, and North Carolina baby blue or else. This, you know, he, he's like, no, no, you know, it's got to be simple. It's got to, you know. And I, I think it's wonderful. And um, again, along all sorts of dimensions, we need to get people thinking differently. Be, and one of the, so one of these days I'm going to have to actually manage somebody. I mean, I've hired in people who are incredibly capable, and it scares me to death that I'm actually going to have to manage. VCs don't manage, um, for sure. And, um, and as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, I'm going to be called to task at some point in time. But right now, it's wonderful having these people just be able to go off and do their thing. And because they're all different, they're going to be able to come together, provide perspective, reach consensus, and then go off and do their thing again. But we need that. Yeah, we need people who are not quite as passionate. And um, it, it's a great question. So thank you. Thank you.